You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. And welcome back to WCDB Albany. My name is Eric Hardiman, and I'm here with Alyssa Lotmore for the Social Workers Radio Talk Show. Welcome back, Alyssa. Hi, Eric. It's so, I can't believe another semester is already starting. I know. It's hard to believe, right? So for those who don't know about the show, we're the Social Workers Radio Talk Show. We've been on the air several years, and our mission is to use the medium of radio to educate and enlighten our university and extended community members about social work trends and current practices provided by social workers. So we are on live once a month usually, and then we have pre-recorded episodes that will play on uh, automation. So we're always trying to have the new topics that are you know, popular to the community. What do you want to hear about? And make that available to the public. So we have students on, we have alums on, we have community members on, and we're hopefully hitting the areas of social work that you want to know about. And one thing that's been really, if you're just tuning in for the first time, one of the things that we love about the Social Workers Radio Talk Show here is that the topics we talk about relate to social work, but they also relate outside of social work so that people, if you're listening in the community and you don't know what social work is, or if you're not a social worker yourself or not interacting with social workers, the topics that we talk about are socially relevant topics. We may be talking about racism. We may be talking about social justice. We may be talking about voting, which today we will be talking about voting for the next hour or so. Perfect for primary day. Perfect for primary day. Today is Thursday, primary day here in New York State, and uh, it's exciting. Another, you know, electric day when people are at the polls, hopefully voting, and... um, Voting is our topic for the day, but but the point being that if you're tuning in, the Social Workers Radio Talk Show is about more than just social work practice. It's about issues that relate to social work and how social workers may intervene, but also how communities can change. So I always look at it as the public is client, and that's one of the things that we like to see. How do we reach individuals who may never have considered seeing or using a social worker And how do we get that message across? A lot of it's about advocacy and raising awareness. So today, what we're going to be talking about is voting. Our topic is voting as social work. And we have two guests today. First, we have Dr. Mary McCarthy, who is of the University of Albany School of Social Welfare. So one of our own. Um, She'll be talking about this voting as social work campaign and how the university and schools of social work and universities in general can bring more awareness to voting and why it's important for students to become engaged. And after that, we'll have a Joe Bonilla, who I'll introduce later, and talk a bit more, a little bit about politics from the political side as, you know, campaigns and polling. And just as a quick reminder to our listeners, before we start our interview, uh, Alyssa, maybe you could tell the listeners how folks can tune in to the show if they're not listening live. There's some ways you can stream our show. You can find our show, I believe, on YouTube. Yes, we do have a show, our channel on YouTube where we can... Uh, have all our archive shows. You can follow us on Twitter. We're um, at Social Workers FM. And we also have a website. If you go on the University of Albany's uh, webpage, www.albany.edu backslash the hyphen social hyphen workers, and you can find us there. Great. So we're very excited and honored to have Dr. Mary McCarthy here with us today. Dr. McCarthy is the director of the bachelor's program in social work in the School of Social Welfare on the downtown campus of the University at Albany and uh, as a longtime social worker and advocate. And uh, welcome to the show, Mary. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Alyssa. Really great to be here. And I always like to say Mary is like the voting expert at the school. If there's any question about voting, I'm always like, see Mary. <laughs> so we're going to jump right into this. Um, and we're going to, uh, Dr. McCarthy is going to focus a little bit on how voting relates to higher ed and students. So let's just say, you know, why is uh, voting important for undergrads who may not always see the connection between maybe politics and their lives? What What is why is it important for undergrads and even graduate students to get involved on their campus with voting and registering to vote? 
Well, I think one of the responsibilities of a university is really to create the kind of space we need for the discussion of different ideas. And through that discussion, we should become better informed citizens. So part of that citizen responsibility is really voting. In a democracy, it's a right that we have. I think we forget that because it's we've had that right for such a long time that if we don't exert that right, it can really be taken away from us. So part of, I think, the responsibility of a university is to help students understand what is what are our responsibilities as we become citizens in our communities, in our state, in our country, and in our world. Mm -hmm. And it's important to realize that, you know, sometimes I hear the, the, oh, my vote doesn't count, or I don't need to go vote, or, you know, it's, it's a shoe in who will win this election. <laughs> and that's not always the case, as, as we've seen in the past. So what can we do to help students or, and, you know, the public in general realize that that's not the case? Yeah, I think um, that's a kind of cynical view about our voice. And right now, there's so much shouting and yelling going on that hmm. I think we forget the power of taking a stand, taking a position, expressing our position through voting. In a particular race, it may not make a difference. There may be overwhelming support for a particular candidate that might not be the person we vote for. I think the Attorney General's election right now is a great example. There are mm. four candidates running. So depending on who you choose, you may feel like your vote didn't count. Right. But the fact that everyone expresses their opinion helps us to know that the person that got elected is the best person for the job. But it's an interesting perspective. If I could interrupt you for a second, Mary. What, one of the, uh, the common things that I've heard from residents of New York, but also from students, is that our vote in New York, because we are a unique state and very much a blue state, uh, may not matter. And then there's the perception that that if you vote for a candidate, that this that New York State is not going to sway the country. For example, it's not a swing state. Uh, it's not a state of particular, uh, you know, that has that power. So when you're talking to students and they have uh, and they make comments like that or express concerns like that, uh, I really like the way you phrase it about expressing your expressing yourself and articulation of your own beliefs, even if that doesn't impact an outcome. And actually, Eric, it's great to use New York as an example of whether we do have power or not, because actually we have quite a number of Republican representatives to Congress, mm. and they have been part of the Trump's team that's really passed legislation in the country that's going to harm New York in the long run. And so I think... It's, we should not assume, if we really believe in those conservative principles, we should make sure those Republicans stay in Congress. Mm -hmm. If we think that's not the right direction to go in, we should be voting to send new representatives to Congress. So we might look blue, but we have a lot of Republican representatives I because see. we are a diverse state and we have a lot of small rural communities mm -hmm. in New York. I think the other thing to remember is right now as we approach the midterm, less than 60% of the eligible voters turned out to vote in the presidential election, which means that all our candidates, not just the president, but everyone representing us was voted in by just over half of the eligible voters. Mm -hmm. So if you say your vote doesn't count, it's not counting because 40% of people aren't showing up to vote. If all 40% of them right. showed up, it would change the dynamics. New York State in that election was lower than most, with only 52.4% of hmm. eligible voters voting in the presidential campaign. So I think we really have to look at the data and help push aside this idea of whose vote counts. 
So how are, how are voting issues and topics incorporated in the classroom? I know there's a lot of different things within the School of Social Welfare, with the summer reading that students had done about voting and the importance of it. So what is, what's being done in the classrooms? So one of the things I'm very proud of about the school is that we have a summer reading for our students about different topics. And this year, we chose uh, the book, Give Us the Ballot, A History of the Voting Rights Act by Ari Berman. And one of the reasons we chose this book is to remind students that it was not that long ago, it was in the 50s and 60s, that African Americans really did not have the right to vote. They might have had the right to vote, but they did not have access to the ballot box right. or to register. And that's the grandparents of the students in our program now. And so helping students see that it's within their own families that people were kept from the ballot box, I think, is really important. Another is barriers to voting. Mm -hmm. How are we, if we really believe in democracy, in the role of one vote for every person, how are our policies, laws, and rules really holding people back? So I think as social workers, policy is practice and practice is policy. And I think it's a way of helping people think about Gosh, I didn't realize that states or even counties or local jurisdictions could set policies that would bar people in certain geographic areas from having access to the ballot box. It resulted in some very rich conversations among our students, and hopefully many of them will go back and ask their grandparents about their experiences with voting as well. I'm curious uh, if you see differences in the students of today and the students of, say, five years ago and ten years ago. Do you think voting, voter registration, voter mobilization, voter access, um, you know, the history of voting rights and that struggle, do you think students are more aware now, less aware? Do you think this is, do you, do you see any changes? I'm just curious about your, your more longitudinal view. Yeah, I actually think students today are more openly interested in social justice issues. Okay. And so if we can begin to link voting, democracy, speech to those social justice issues, I think that's really capturing students, young students' imaginations. And I think five, eight years ago, there was a kind of complacency about those things that the current times have really raised people's awareness. So I think we can capitalize on that with our students today. And interestingly, I, I, I think of voting as a first step. I think of voting as something that's exercising your right as a citizen, but it's a first step toward involvement, mm -hmm. whatever that involvement might look like. And so I guess I'm wondering when you work particularly with undergraduate students here on the campus, uh, do you see students going beyond voting, where they are actually getting involved in, say, volunteer efforts to register others to vote? Or are they getting involved politically or in advocacy or community engagement type efforts? I think the advocacy and community engagement, yes. And um, I just want to talk a little about what's happening at UAlbany, because Great. I think that creates a larger context for this conversation, which is that the Office of Student Affairs is leading a voter registration and engagement effort. It's called UAlbany Votes. That The role of that group is to advance civic engagement initiatives across the campus, develop innovative and inclusive ideas that can be implemented, and creating a culture of civic engagement. And as a result of you know, leadership of young people like Cheryl Simmons on mm. this campus who knows how to use social media like Alyssa does and I don't, <laughs> um, that many more students are all of a sudden popping up. So there's this whole group of public administration undergrads that self-organized to create UAlbany votes. Our BSWA students are going to hold voter registration drives on the downtown campus. Okay. And that has never really happened before in a long time on the campus. Right. So I think there is a new intersection between these ideas of social justice and really a right to vote. So maybe um, maybe part of what I hear you saying is that social justice can be the hook that gets people interested in this topic and, mm -hmm. and gets folks to see that um, 
if politics and the news and things that that we see on the news seem remote, if they seem not related to one's life, particularly for undergraduate life, where where life tends to be focused around the campus and around learning and a little insular at times, uh, that social justice and belief in social justice might be a hook that could get people in, interested. Exactly, because they s even if they're not reading the news, they see the injustices through their social media feed. Ah. So that, I think, it's it speaks to our emotions mm -hmm. and our passions, and I think students really get engaged around those ideas. So police shootings of young black men right. or environmental injustices or the climate change. I mean, we have this huge storm bearing down on North Carolina right now that is going to have could have devastating impacts and I think students really see that's very alive for them and right. so how does voting relate to those issues right now we talked a little bit about see what UAlbany is doing but there's a lot of things that universities across the country are doing and one of the things that I'm looking at right now is the voting is social work uh, campaign mm -hmm. and it's pretty much saying that voting is central to social works values and uh, social justice mission and it gives individuals and communities the power to voice their opinions and affect change um, so what is what, can you give us like sort of an overview of what's happening across the country because it's, it seems like people are more and more active right now in trying to get students to vote and trying to get universities to really embrace, you know, what's happening today. Yeah, that's a, a great point, Alyssa. And I think um, for years now, there's been an institute in, um, at the University of Connecticut called mm -hmm. the Humphreys Institute for political action founded by Nancy Humphreys, really one of the great social work leaders in our country. And through that institute, they've really started to work with the Association of Community Organizing Social Workers, ACOSA, Hunter College, Mima Abramowitz, who's a, a really mm -hmm. well-known writer in these areas on women's rights and policy, and begun to organize schools of social work around the country and joined by NASW, our National Association of Social Workers, and the Council of Social Work Education, which accredits schools of social work. Everyone has come together in this um, coalition to say, we really need students, faculty, people to be engaged in our civic responsibilities. And one of the things that we know is that there is a school of social work in every congressional district in the United States. Interesting. So that becomes a huge way to help students understand there's a direct relationship between who gets elected to public office and the health of your university and mm -hmm. college and your education and the education of people in your community. So I think it's through leadership from the Humphrey Institute, ACOSA, CSWE, and NASW that schools of social work have really responded to this call to action. So I'm curious, Mary, if you could talk a little bit about the concept of partisanship and how that plays a role now. Because I, I often think in a profession like social work, sometimes, uh, and even in higher education sometimes, there is a tendency to... Um, to want to reach a wide variety of students and a wide variety of community members by not being partisan and by uh, by trying to reach the interests of people across a range of, of uh, perspectives and positions. So has there been a reluctance of social work and other professions to get involved in voting and politics because of its partisan nature? Not for NASW, the National Association of Social Workers. They've had a separate political action camp, uh, political action group since the late early 90s. Okay. Um, so I think be, we really grew out of Mary Richmond, Jane Adams, the kind of tension between the two, case to cause, cause to case. Yeah. And I think that legacy has reminded us about the role of policy. Policy is practice. Well, where does policy come from? But our elected representatives. So I think what I think what all associations and groups in this country have to do is look at the issues and mm. not the person's registration. You know, there are many Republicans who have done 
really heroic leadership work on mental health parity, mm -hmm. on uh, gay and lesbian rights, because their children were gay or lesbian, or because they had a daughter who was a mentally ill. Like these social issues don't discriminate. All families experience them. And I think as social workers, we want people representing us who will serve the clients that we serve and the communities that we serve. And I think NASW in particular has really worked hard to look at the issues and what the person stands for as opposed to their enrollment. Okay, great. And before we get into how our listeners can get involved, what are some barriers to, to voting? Yeah, so um, there are a number of them, and I, I feel like they're growing by the day, which really worries me, um, because we were founded on this principle of one person, one vote. But some are very confusing registration and identification requirements, whether people actually have to show picture ID, even if they're officially registered, we know who they are, do they have to actually pull out a picture ID when they show up to vote? If they haven't voted in several years, can their name be taken off the rolls, which requires re-registration? Polling places change, so how is information communicated? I've heard stories of polling places changing the week before an election and no notification going out. So people show up, they don't have cars, and now the new polling place is five miles away and they have no way of getting there. Long lines, um, lack of information on candidates and what the issues mm -hmm. are. The ballots change all the time. Sometimes you actually have to flip the ballot over and vote for a referendum on the back of a ballot. Who's helping people to understand how these are set up? And it's true, but sometimes I even go into the polls and I'm like, well, this is different. And I'm looking at it. And even though I might be not more knowledgeable on the voting process and what's going on, I still even am looking sometimes like, did I do that right? I don't even know. And it's, it, it's confusing. Exactly. So I think there are many, many ways that other countries have mm -hmm. set up voting that makes it much clearer and simpler. So one is the minute you register a car or apply for a driver's license, you are automatically registered to vote that it goes seamlessly into the voter registration rules, that people um, have the opportunity when they change their address through their license or through their car registration, that change of address automatically goes to voter registration. We are the only country that does not have voting on a weekend to make it easy for people with hourly wage jobs to vote. All other countries have voting on a weekend. Why do we have it on a Tuesday? It, it's, there are many things that are done in ways that make you wonder, mm -hmm. are they purposefully done to ensure that only certain people actually show up to vote? So I think home voting, Oregon has a fantastic um, mail-in ballot system now for the whole state. You don't even have to apply for it. The ballot comes to your house, you vote on your kitchen table, you put it in an envelope and you send it back in. That allows you to look at the ballot and really understand how is this ballot designed. So I mm -hmm. think there are many ways as a country that we could reduce the barriers to voting if we really wanted everyone to vote. Yeah. And if students are interested in helping to raise awareness about these issues, if they're interested in getting involved in voting rights issues, how do they, uh, how would they do that? Yeah, so a great way is to go on TurboVote and actually register, it's an app that you can register on and um, if you register through TurboVote, you will get automatic text notifications before an election, uh, before the primary. If you need to get an absentee ballot, they'll send it to you with a stamped self-addressed envelope. And the University at Albany is really promoting the use of TurboVote to, to help students get much more engaged. If you go on TurboVote and you're not registered, but you have a license, you just put your license number into the TurboVote app and they will automatically populate a voter registration form for you that you can simply then check what party you want to belong to and send it in. So TurboVote as an app is really spectacular and you just you can go on the University at Albany website to the Office of Student Affairs and get the link to TurboVote or you can just type in on your 
browser turbovote.org and go right there. And as we have our final question uh, before we bring on our next guest, for those listening, how can they get involved? Is there certain any last minute uh, tips or suggestions or something you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, one of the most enjoyable things that any of us can do is if there's a candidate that we're particularly interested in after today's primary, call them up and say, do you need volunteers? Because there are many, many tasks that candidates need before election day, such as phone calls, phone banks, leafleting, going to the farmer's market and helping them shake hands, walking your neighborhood with a candidate. And I think that's, it's something you could do for an hour or two hours when you have the time. And it's an easy way for you to get to know the human beings behind the candidates. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, primary day, and if you're living in Albany, it is 12 o'clock noon that the polls open. So you can head there pretty soon after the show. Um, Mary, thank you so much for coming on and giving us a really good overview of what's happening in the university and sort of what's going on nationally at schools and colleges and how we're getting students to vote and showing the importance of it. Because I think sometimes how you said, people get in this mind frame, a mindset that maybe my vote doesn't count or why should I care about this if it's not a presidential election or mm -hmm. why why does this matter? And it really, it does matter. And thank you for all the efforts you've been doing at the School of Social Welfare and with the university to help really have students see this I impact and helping to arrange the voter registration tables with students so it's making a difference and i want to thank you for that and thank you both for the opportunity thank you mary it's, it's wonderful to have a faculty leader on the radio show with us and a faculty leader who's inspiring students to vote themselves to register others to vote to become civically engaged and and just to think about these issues in a deeper way and to think that maybe education is not just what happens in the classroom but it's also how students get involved in the community and i think that's part of what your leadership is doing uh, so i think you albany students are very fortunate to have you uh, as part of the faculty and um, we look forward to hearing more about these efforts in the future great we hope you'll return but don't leave us, listeners, because even though Mary's stepping out, we do have another guest. We'll have Joe Bonilla, who is the managing partner, senior media director, and co-founder of the PR and communications firm Relentless Awareness. So we're really excited to have him on after the break. So definitely don't leave us. <laughs> we will have a short commercial uh, interruption here, and by that I mean a public service announcement. And then we will have Joe Bonilla with us back on the Social Workers Radio Talk Show. Right, class. Let's hear what everyone did this weekend. Jill? Well, I raised my older sister to a big oak tree. It was at least a hundred years old. My mom said I must have set a record or something. And then we went down by a stream and perched up on this huge rock and saw all of these little minnows swimming around way below us. And then I rescued my little brother from an evil slug king who was guarding him in the bush fortress. And my sister and I brought him back to our super twig fort for safety. And then we all laid out and told stories until it got dark. And the Big Dipper led us all the way home. Wow. Wow. Awesome. Where were you, Jill? Yeah. We went to the forest. It's not that far away. Anyone want to come this weekend? <laughs> Ask your parents to take you and your friends to the forest this week and find the fun, adventurous you. It's closer than you think. Check out discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Welcome back to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. If you've just tuned in, you're listening to WCDB Albany, and this is the Social Workers Live Radio Talk Show. My name is Eric Hardiman, and I'm here with my co-host, Alyssa Lotmore. Welcome back, Alyssa. Hey, Eric. For our 22nd break, I'm glad to be back and still here. <laughs> That's right. We have just had, we just concluded about a 30-minute interview with Dr. Mary McCarthy from the School of Social Welfare here at the University of Albany talking about voting and its relationship to social work, its relationship to undergraduate education, its role and importance in civic society right now. And so we have another guest for the next half hour, and I'll let Alyssa do the introduction here. So we have Joe Bonilla, he's the managing partner, senior media director, and co-founder of the PR and communications firm Relentless Awareness. 
recognized as a leading communications professional in the Northeast. Major brands, companies, organizations, and public figures rely on Joe's counsel and insight in moving their message forward with impressive results. From bringing ride sharing to upstate New York and Long Island, to working with rising leaders at the local, state, and federal level, Mr. Bonilla works tirelessly to enhance and advocate for each of his clients. And the list goes on. But let's get to the real good stuff. He's a UAlbany <laughs> grad, Rockefeller College, class of 2011. And most importantly, and Eric, this might be the best thing, he used to have a show on the one and only WCDB 90.9 FM. That's right. So welcome, Joe. <laughs> it's great to be back. What we affectionately call a CDB alum. We're That's welcome right. back to the studio, a different studio. It is a different where, studio. Where I was over in Studio show. B, yeah. and uh, this is always a great time to be back here, you know, where the radio roots have began. There you go. Great, great. We love the the uh, the medium of radio here. Even though it's old school and it's not quite as, as new as social media, we are streaming now live, which I believe probably was not the case when you were here. Uh, it was. Oh, yeah, it was, it was okay. the nascent era of uh, streaming, you know, the feed might cut out from time to time, but you know, it, we still made a go of it, you know? Great. We are excited to have you here. The topic today, if you've just tuned in, is voting. And today is primary Thursday here in New York. And uh, we're, we're really interested to hear all about your career, certainly, and about your accomplishments, but, but really most specifically about voting, about the role of voting and civic engagement. And you've got a different perspective than Dr. McCarthy had as an educator, but your perspective as someone who's worked on several campaigns, possibly from the other side of the, um, the room, I guess you might say, someone who's really seen the political process, the voting process, the polling process, you know, a lot about polling, uh, seen that from the side of someone on a campaign. And so we're really curious to hear, how is voting different from that perspective? And, and how does that uh, possibly translate to voters? Absolutely. So just to give you a little bit additional background, I probably have worked on about 100 campaigns in the local, state, and federal level, uh, many of which in the capital region, some on a statewide basis. And for what my firm, what I have done is more on the communication side, but also trying to get voter engagement. Yeah, how do we connect with potential voters? How do we get new voters? How do we get uh, voters that we call super primes, those who actually vote in elections year after year in primary elections, general elections, for s library board, for school board? And what we try to always identify is the importance of voting in every single election. There's a lot of times that people think that whatever happens in the White House is the most important thing that happens to them. But really, it's those who uh, make decisions at the local level, the state level, that really impact your life. Whether it's you know rebuilding a road to your schools, to you know going to school here in terms of the budget that we have here for you Albany. And that's what we try to always instill into the candidates that we work with in terms of developing that issue platform, whether it's on education, it's on jobs, the environment, uh, social justice impact, criminal justice. And what we ultimately try to build is a campaign that actually works for everybody involved. And what I mean everybody involved is obviously there's different interests, you know, from residential interests to commercial interests. Uh, institutional interest, whether it's for schools, for hospitals, for uh, nonprofits, and we try to really build a, a platform for that. But all of that comes down to, well, at the end of the day, people need to vote. And there's many ways that we try to engage people to vote, you know, whether it's, you know, a, at, at this point, you know, for those campaigns that are you know, running for the nomination for their respective parties today, you know, they're looking at what can we do to get out the vote, whether it's uh, doing direct mail, television, radio, digital media is really picking up a lot right now. Okay. Um, one thing I've noticed a lot is you're getting a lot of text based campaign ads, which right. I, th I think is going to be the unfortunate future in some respects. Um, but that's really the key. Is but uh, what we always try to, it, to instill into folks is why is it important to vote? Um, when you are a prime voter, candidates will pay attention to you much more. Uh, if we see on your voting record, which is public, 
uh, not about who you voted for, but at least you voted. Right. We identify, okay, well, this person voted in the primary last year. They voted in the general election. They voted for school board, for library board, whatever it could be. We know that you're most likely going to vote again. And that's why somebody who thinks, well, I never received any mail from that campaign. Well, you're not on our list because you haven't voted yet. Now, for new voters, you're also another target demographic that we're also trying to attract because we don't know what that record could look like. Yeah. Uh, but what it really comes down to is trying to identify what is important to that voter. What actually you know, works for that audience and you know, in that respect, that's what we ultimately try to engage with. So you do a lot with polls as well and what do the polls mean and how do they matter? So there's public polling and private polling and informal polling. And what polling does, it actually changes the behavior of voters. When you have a public poll, uh, for example, there was a recent Siena poll that had Governor Cuomo up by at least 25 points over his challenger, Cynthia Nixon. What that can actually do is actually depress turnout, where folks might believe that that person who's up by 20, 30, 40 points, oh, they have it in the bag. And so for them, for that campaign, it's actually, you know, it looks like, oh, well, they're so much in the lead. Well, as we saw in the summer down in Queens with a congressional race where they had the private polling and the public polling said, oh, you know, Representative Joe Crowley was up by 35 points over his challenger, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She ultimately beat him by 15 points because most likely those people who said, well, Congressman Crowley probably has this race in the bag, they didn't show up. And so what that can do, it can have a huge impact. When it's down to a, a race where you see it's neck and neck, where it might be off by a few points, um, that will actually energize both sides of really understanding what that can be. And what we have seen, especially on, on the private polling side, private polling, if done correctly, can actually look, basically identify to a, a couple of points of, uh, of a difference to actually what the ultimate result will be. We had a candidate who was running locally here, and what we were finding out in the field from campaigning, doing door-to-door, and what our polling was gonna show is that the race was 50-50. Okay. And what the actual primary day result was, 50-50 with a difference of a few points out of 10,000 votes cast. Um, the other part of that is obviously every vote counts. It, for that particular candidate, we were hoping like out of 10,000 votes, it was off by 38 votes. And when you think about, like, you know 38 people that could have voted for you. Right. And that's the most ultimately frustrating thing with that. But um, polling is incredibly important. What we're finding now, especially with these huge upsets, is that polling is inherently, it needs to actually have that 2.0 phase. Because polling uh, companies still utilize landlines for the most part. Mm-hmm. And what we're finding is that most people, I mean, I don't have a landline at home, I have a landline in my office, but most people who actually would be the ones that you might want are not going to be, be able to be connected by. So um, that's why I've never polled? I don't have that, a that is actually a big reason why you're not <laughs> polled. Um, you could be polled by a private polling company. Um, we could poll you because, you know, what we find is that as part of that voter file that your phone number is in there, whether it's a cell phone number, it's a landline mm-hmm. number. So the private polling usually is a little bit better than the public polling. Um, but nonetheless, uh, polling is uh, in for a reckoning and it's, as we've seen the last couple of years it's something that it desperately needs some change and what's your sense of public the public perception of polling and confidence in polling my sense is that in the last let's say four to five years there's been possibly a decrease in confidence public confidence around polling because uh, depending on who's conducted the polls uh, one might say something is fake news, quote unquote, or one might question the the validity of a poll because it comes from uh, a, an institution of higher ed versus a private organization. Do you do you have a, a thoughts on on how we might increase uh, public perceptions and confidence? Sure. So the confidence level in, in terms of public polling is absolutely has gone down. And even for those who are aggregation polling sources, such as 538, the public confidence level has gone you know, into the toilet at that point. But uh, what needs to happen is that there has to be a bit, as you've seen with in terms of validating different sources. And what it really comes down to is understanding what is actually important to look at in terms of a poll. Are they, regi- are they polling registered voters? Are they polling likely voters, likely Democratic voters, likely Republican voters, likely independent voters. Um, what is the overall validity of that poll when you cross-check that against the actual results from that campaign? Mm-hmm. Um, so those sources are out there, and there are a few websites that actually do that real real 
Clear Politics actually will show you the uh, polling validity of that. Uh, and so you have some institutions, you know, locally, and at least in the Hudson Valley, you have Siena College, you have uh, Marist will do polling. And actually, Siena College, actually, on a national basis, actually is one of the top uh, regarded polling uh, organizations. And so when you look at that, and you look, obviously, with this last week, with the polls that have been taken in terms of the uh, election for governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, Given that they have a high confidence level in terms of the validity of that poll, very much their their poll is probably not too far from the truth that we'll see later today. Great. And you talked a little bit about mailers going out and different things, and I get a lot of my news for elections and candidates from social media. So I'm curious as to how the role of social media has changed and what the impact is when candidates are using different types of social media to reach uh, particular audiences. Because I get a ton of those flyers and I'll admit I don't really look at them in the mail. Um, I look at the social media pages. So just to touch on direct mail for a moment. Uh, direct mail is the last bastion of a guaranteed c contact with a voter. Even though you may look at the mailer for two seconds before you throw it in the trash, that's still one to two seconds. Maybe it might be as four to five seconds, right? That's a guarantee. We don't know with a great degree whether or not somebody's actually looking at the ads on social media, whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and understanding if they're a voter or not. The the cross-checking of a user against uh, their voting file is actually, it's it's horrendous, it's actually a horrendous data problem right now. And But what you're finding is that one of the things that's actually going to be a huge game changer in the very, very near future is the use of quote unquote viral videos by candidates mm -hmm. where they may look like they're organic, where it might be a rally or some sort of, you know, protest event. But a lot of times those are actually organized by PR folks like myself. And those are things that actually resonate with people where you're looking at those sorts of that sort of content, whether it's not just for those two to five seconds of a direct mail piece, but th that person might be watching this video for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, maybe two minutes. That's that's an advertiser's dream in that regard. If you're able to actually pay attention to that law and actually be able to absorb the message. And then, of course, you're seeing it among your friend network. You're among seeing it among the followers that you have and who you're following. Following. And so digital media, it's still it's still in the early phase in terms of how we're actually going to be able to utilize it on the political advertising side. But nonetheless, what it does, and, and two aspects is one, it informs and educates a person about a candidate. The other side, which is the, a little bit more nefarious, is that it keeps people in their echo chambers about you know who they're actually uh, supporting. So if you are supporting candidates X, Y, and Z, and they believe in the same thing, you may not see anything on the other side. Does that make really your your vantage point better when you actually go into the booth? And that's really the problem that we see you know on our end is you only might see one candidate, you may not see their opponent. Right. And so if you're trying to actually make a, a well-educated uh, choice in the ballot box, you may not see anything from the other side. So how can you actually look at it unless you're relying on news media? And unfortunately, especially for the lower races, community papers, local papers are seeing you know layoff after layoff after layoff. So in terms of getting real unbiased information, it's getting tougher and tougher for for voters to actually get that information. So it really comes back down to the campaigns to be able to do the right thing and inform people of a, of a, a candidate's positions and their issues and what they believe in and not get into the silly season of negative ads and things like that. So I'm curious, you mentioned echo chamber, and I'm curious about this uh, echo chamber phenomenon and the idea of extreme polarization. And what we hear in the news uh, frequently is that things have become so polarized in this country that folks don't keep an open mind and don't consider changing their mind and that uh, you get sort of a bleak pessimism sometimes that things will people have their positions and they will stay in their corners and will not move uh, from your perspective is is that the case or do you think that's changing do you think there's room for moving away from this extreme polarization I think it's getting worse. Uh, I'll start with that. I think if you were to date it back, I look at the rise of cable television. 
uh, you know, you look at the 60s and the early 70s, you had three networks. Mm -hmm. And then you began to get, oh, there's a food network, there's a Discovery Channel, there's Nickelodeon. And then you get even more into you know, delving into what people's interests are. And so what we've seen in terms of the media landscape, in terms of like identifying what you only care about versus having a broader brush in terms of seeing everything and having that collective cultural experience, People are now able to, based upon behavioral algorithms on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and other sources, you're only really able to see what you click on, and because folks like myself can be able to use that data to actually target those demographics. Mm -hmm. And so the unfortunate thing is that, and what was kind of a, a potential bright spot in all of this is that you have only Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so you have these larger platforms. We don't have, you know, there's not... 10 Facebook, you know, platforms. They're not 10 or 20 different Instagram and, and Twitter platforms that are doing the same thing. We have these three larger platforms, including uh, Snapchat as well. But the problem is because it is so behavioral based in the terms of the data, no matter what you do, unless you are totally looking at everything and clicking like on both sides, you're only going to be able to see one side of the coin. And so unless you know, we actually change the algorithm, which I don't think is going to happen. The The issue is that we're going to get further and further into, in terms of some people are only going to like this, that, and the other, and they will have no tolerance for the other side and vice versa. And that really does not build a better society among any of us because unless we understand what the other side is trying to think, how can we actually come together and be able to actually build real policy decisions that are rooted in terms of looking at both sides of it? Interesting. So, since we're a so show on social work, I have a question that you might be able to offer some advice. I hope. So, <laughs> for social work students um, and even community members who want to be more active in politics in terms of advocacy, what can they do? Because I think sometimes people want to, but they don't know where to start. I think your previous guest made mention of that in terms of, yeah, how do you get involved with the campaign? I think at first, you know, volunteering for a campaign is one of the most wonderful things you can do. But I think even before that, going online, looking at your local news source, you pick up a newspaper and actually seeing what the issues are for each candidate and, and identifying, you know, what actually, uh, what which candidate actually speaks to your inner values. And then to engage with that candidate, you know, whether to volunteer, at least to talk to that person, whether at their campaign office or if they're currently in office, to be able to reach out to their respective legislative office or executive office. Um, but to be involved in that respect, and because there's so many opportunities for, uh, especially students who are majoring in, in social welfare and social work, in that side of uh, the coin, to actually be able to engage because we need those folks in our politics. And it's interesting too. I, I think about you know being involved in the, myself in the business of higher education here at the university. Back in the '60s, you talked historically about the rise of uh, cable TV and cable news specifically, but also campuses back then were different, and campuses, uh, higher education campuses were a political nexus. That's where things happened, and we, and we heard about protests on campus, and we read about uh, all that happened on various campuses around this country, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts about how that's changed over time, and have, have students and college campuses become a little bit forgotten in the political scene and, and and is there room for that to change? I think what you find is that every, whether it's half a generation or a generation, that you do see uh, students who want to see change in their community, they will rise up. The methods and the means of how they do that are going to be totally different. Um, you look at 10 years ago when I was a student here, uh, 10 plus years ago, uh, the rise of a candidate from Illinois called Barack Obama. And you saw a lot of organizing here on campus in terms of uh, efforts with Albany for Obama. And also after that, you saw with the Occupy movement. And that was a huge thing that was built really on the backs of, of college students and, and young people. And so that spirit always is going to be there. Uh, how it actually goes into the public sphere has changed. Uh, instead of doing um, necessarily rallies and leafleting and, and more impactful events, a lot of it's happening on you know, mobile devices and on, on the internet. So that organizing is still there. 
And in terms of what they actually care about, what you're finding is that they're now realizing young people and whether they're college students or high school students, they're realizing their full potential that you have to be able to really break through and keep at it. The the number one thing we, you know, we always tell for folks who want to get into advertising and PR is keep that message retention and keep it going. And what we've seen, especially uh, in the light of a number of incidents that have taken place in terms of gun violence, is that you've had a lot of push by college students and high school students on the issue. Mm-hmm. And it hasn't been done through traditional media. It's been done right. by digital media right. and, and organizing in that way. And you've seen the impact in terms of digital organizing where you have protests and marches and, and wonderful organizing events that are able to capture not just that demographic, but can you know spread throughout, you know, in terms of no matter, you know, uh, the age of the person. And so in terms of really being that nexus for everything, I think everything still starts here. I think everything still the beginning of the spirit of change happens on college campuses. But, you know, that's really what the difference is that the method and the ultimate platform has changed. Fascinating. Now there is an election today. It's primary day. Um, it's not a presidential though. So why should people still care, I guess. You know, people think sometimes the presidential ones are the ones that are most important. That's what's going to impact them. That's what we're excited for. But there is some important races happening today, and why should people still get out there and vote? So if you are a student here at the University of Albany, or you're a college student, and you receive TAP, you receive EOP, um, or even just go to a public higher educational institution, what happens uh, in Albany makes a humongous impact upon your life. And that's what we're voting for today. That's who we're nominating today for governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general. And certainly in November, we are going to be uh, electing our representatives for assembly and state senate as well. Those are the folks that have the greatest impact upon your daily life. On top of which, and each year there's always an election. People think, well, every four years I have to vote, I have to vote for president. No, there, there are multiple elections each year. You know, whether it's for mayor, your, your city council, your county legislature, your county executive, library board, school board, whatever it could be, governor, lieutenant governor, every single local and state election has a greater impact than who you may like for president, who may, you may not like for president. And that's really the most important thing is that the issues that you care about, whether it's higher education, the environment, whether or not a road has potholes and you want them to be filled in, if you're... Uh, public library has you know the funding it requires all of that takes place at the local level that's why it's so brutally important for folks to register to vote and then to vote uh one of the things that people always think well i only have to vote once a year no there's always an election uh, i implore you to look at your board of elections website i implore you to look at your school district's website in terms of what's coming up because that those are the decisions you know the, you're voting for the people who make the greatest amount of impact in your life and that's where it's really important who really cares about who's actually occupying the white house it really makes a difference at who's actually occupying the executive mansion and the chambers inside of here in albany It's a great perspective, Joe. So if you just tuned in, you're listening to The Social Worker's live radio talk show, and our guest is Joe Bonilla, who's the managing partner of Relentless Awareness. I want to ask you, Joe, a little bit about that organization. I have to say, I love the the name. There we go. (laughs) It's it's positive, it's energetic, it's relentless. Relentless Awareness. Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So uh, we formed the firm with another UAlbany alum, Rich Fazio, six and a half years ago. Uh, I had gotten my degree from Rockefeller College in public policy. I worked for another PR firm. It was not the PR firm for me. And ended up doing freelance work, working with candidates, working with small businesses. And you figure, well, if I'm already doing it on the freelance side of things, why not just form the organization for this? So here with two guys, you know, actually Rich actually has his degree in sociology. And so we formed this organization. We have $200 to our name. And now we have, you know, we have a good team of 10 people all together. We have two offices in Albany and Greenville, South Carolina, about 40 accounts. But really what we try to always instill to our clients is that you have to be, you know, you might be a craft beverage manufacturer. You might be a real estate developer. You might be a nonprofit, a restaurant, um, an advocacy campaign. 
what is really ultimately in the public interest? And sometimes we have to be the conscious in the room and say, like, yes, you know, you have a great business, you have a great organization, but and you're affecting obviously your consumers and everything like that. But like, what else are you doing in your community? And whether it's in Albany, in Troy, in New York City, wherever it could be. We try to at least instill that mission for that, and we are always nonstop in our approach um, to achieve these goals. And it's not easy. It's uh, certainly not a nine to five gig. Um, but what, what you have to do, at least, and especially for those who might w- want to be more entrepreneurial, you have to love what you want to do. And so the hours, the pay, don't make any difference except when it really comes down to having true passion for what you actually want to do. And uh, so for every day, I, I love what I do. There's some days which are a little more challenging than others, but um, it's, it's great and I have a great team together, so it's been fun. And you don't give yourself enough credit. You are also won several awards, both yourself and your organization. So there's a lot of things that you're doing to make an impact and really make a name for yourself. And you also sponsor what little league team? We we have we did sponsor a national little league team, and actually the team won. Uh, right, so right. that was very fun. Um, but there are things that we yeah we, we partner and support local in, uh, community initiatives, and some things that yeah we are recognized for. And other times we will support something very quietly because we believe it's right. Mm-hmm. And that idea of doing something that's ethical and doing something that's right and doing something promoting the idea of giving back to the community and getting involved is one that I think really resonates here at the university, uh, certainly with those of us who are teaching, but also with students. And I think, uh, I think that's important. And maybe to bring it back to voting, that, that's something that I see embedded in everything you've said, is the importance of getting out to vote, the importance of articulating what it is you believe in and doing what's right, not for an intrinsic reward, but doing what's right because it's right. Right. And, and the other part of it, too, is that if you're not voting, you're probably not also civically involved or at least volunteering. So at least the, the, be- the first step you can ever do, if you want to begin to be civically involved, help a friend out. Volunteer for whatever cause that's close to your heart. And then it will all come magically together because you will ultimately care about your community in that way. You sound like a social worker by default, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Honorary social there worker. There we go. So we only have about two minutes left, and I have one more important question to ask. Tell us about your show on WCDB. Oh, boy. <laughs> we want to hear. Okay. So we had you know, myself and Jackie Cohen. Jackie actually uh, hosts a radio show down in New York City right now, too. We had a show called Joe and Jackie in the Morning. And it was it always started off. I mean, we did news, talk, and fun. It was an hour. It was Monday through Thursday here at CDB. And it was fun. And I did the show every day. Jackie, well, she took a couple of days off. So I had to host the show by myself. Um, but we had a great time. We did it, uh, let's say, spring 2011. We had that. And I was also involved with uh, Albany Student Television here at a couple of shows on that as well. So, you know, in terms of uh, that, you know, back and forth student, I'm a public policy major, but love broadcasting. And so, you know, I always love any opportunity I can come up to CDB, and it's always great to be here. Well, thank you so much for being on today. Again, this was Joe Bonilla, the managing partner, senior media director, and co-founder of Relentless Awareness. He came on to talk about politics and why you should be politically or civically engaged and go out and vote today. And we'd love to have you back anytime, Joe. You're always welcome as an alum here at CDB, but you're always welcome as a guest on our show, certainly. Uh, you, you could come back and do your own show if hey, you wanted there you to go. do a guest <laughs> show. We like to have alumni come back and do shows as a one-off. So I uh, absolutely love the opportunity. Anytime you'd like to do that, the offer is there. There we go. You've been listening to the Social Workers live radio talk show here. Again, I'm your co-host, Eric Hardiman, here with Alyssa Lotmore. Thanks for helping, Alyssa. And thank you for being here, Joe. We will be back. When will we be back, Alyssa? In October. In October. Ooh. Do we have a date? No, That's, we don't uh, have a date yet. But yeah, we, we look will, at my calendar. We will I think. promote Some it. point October, right? It. Some I believe point it's October. October 4th, maybe. Is that right? Our goal is to be on live uh, once a month and with pre-records of automations of maybe even some new segments. But it will always be promoted and we will share that. But this time slot. So every Thursday, something will air at 10 a.m. And speaking of social media, I will bang the drum again. Make sure to check our Facebook page, our, our Twitter page, Twitter page Social Workers FM. and YouTube, where yes. you can listen to old archived interviews, including this one, which will be up later this afternoon, if you happen to miss the beginning part. Thanks for listening. This is WCDB Albany.